Now, take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 37. The book of the Psalms and uh, chapter 37, and we're going to get into God's Word here this morning. You've already had instructions about your church app and checking in, and you can give online, and you can find the sermon notes and so on on there. But um, So I'm not going to go through all that again. We're just going to get right into it this morning, and uh, we're going to have a good time. Now, this is uh, 14 weeks since we started all of this and since our restrictions began. And during that time, we have been preaching and talking about, you know, how to have true faith in troublesome times. We started in Romans, and we finished over several different places in the Bible doing more topical preaching about this. Today I want to talk to you about how to have comfort in a crisis, how to have comfort in a crisis. If we were to write a Reader's Digest version of the news for 2020, we could almost do it in just three words. And those words for the Reader's Digest version of the news for 2020 would be impeachment, coronavirus, and injustice. In the same report, we could summarize the general reaction of everyone in three words. They would be the words fear and worry and anger. You say anger? Yep, there's a lot of anger out there. There's a lot of anger in people's hearts today. And uh, it's very interesting the difficult times that we are living in. Now there's a crisis. There's a crisis concerning the integrity in public officials. It's at an all-time low. Distrust in the same officials is at an all-time high. Hospitals are filling up, resources are running low, patience is running out, and confidence in the civil society is waning. Uh, Parents, your children really need some instruction and encouragement from you during this time because while they've been locked down, shut up, watching a lot of TV and stuff on the internet, they've seen lots of vitriolic politicians. They've seen lots of stuff going on in the streets, and there's, they, they need your guidance. They need you to help them during this time. So I guess we can say with all safety that that utopian thought that came at the end of World War I, we're going to have a utopia in the world, that's just gone completely out the window. And to tell you the truth, folks, there's not going to be a utopia until King Jesus is sitting on the throne in Jerusalem in the millennium. That's when it's going to begin. Things are going to be great. Now, this situation is very familiar in the human experience. Uh, And I want to share just a few verses from an old prophet. Uh, He said during his times that it seemed that no one called for justice, nor did any plead for the truth. Uh, Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. The way of peace they have not known. There is no justice in their ways. Uh, It says that justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but we find darkness. We look for brightness, but we find blackness. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off. Truth has fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. And so here's what it says the Lord thought about it. So truth fails, and he who who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. There's not anybody more displeased with a lack of justice, righteousness, and truth in the world today than God himself. You say, where'd you find that? That's Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah the prophet writing to his people during that time saying that there's a period of injustice. There's always been during times like that a remnant of people who know how to live. Uh, They know how to thrive in times of trouble. And there is a way for us, and this is what I want to preach to you about this morning. There is a way for us during this time to live when truth, justice, mercy, and grace seem to have vanished from the public view. Now, I want us to go now to Psalm 37, and we're going to read this passage that speaks directly to us, and how to live in a crisis, how to find comfort in a crisis. Now, this psalm was written by David. He was an old man. We'll get to that in a moment, but uh, he's got some things to share with us. I wish you'd stand at your feet for just a minute in honor of the Word of God. I'll read it. We'll, we'll, read, we'll restart our public reading together in a few weeks, but let me read the passage to you this morning, Psalm 37, verse 1 through 8. And if you're there uh, on live stream, you've got your own Bibles, you can be looking at this passage of Scripture. And here's the Word of God. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. 
dwell in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Interesting passage of Scripture. The whole chapter deals with the subject. The first eight verses lay it out clearly. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we ask that you'd add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word today. We do live in a topsy-turvy world. Uh, There are fears because of the sicknesses, and there's worries because of the unsettled nature of our society. There are racial problems, and there is division in many many places and for many reasons. And and God, uh, at a time like this, we can fret, or there's times like this we can have faith and trust you. I pray, Father, you give me the words that you would have me share this morning to be an encouragement and a blessing and also a challenge to believers. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And you could be seated. Well, I've already met guests today. I met several guests in the first service that this is their very first time to come to Grace Church. And so we certainly welcome you. And uh, for those of you that are out there tuning in for the very first time, or maybe you just picked us up during the COVID-19, we welcome you as well. We're so excited that you're here. We look forward to the day that uh, we can give a warm handshake to everyone and welcome you. We, we're not able to do a lot of our things that we normally do, such as lunch on us and some of these events to welcome people. People, but we'll get started up again soon. So we're so thankful to be able to do what we are doing. As I said a moment ago, David was an old man. Uh, verse 25 says, I have been young and am now old. So we know that's true about this passage of Scripture. Uh, through the years, he had, endured, he had endured many circumstances that were difficult, caused his heart to fear, to fret, to worry. Uh, in fact, um, he, uh, he actually fretted and got a little bit upset from time to time. Uh, he was thankful for the peace of God and the deliverance of God, but he even prayed some imprecatory prayers that are, re- that are recorded in the Psalms. You say, what in the world are imprecatory? prayers. Well, he got so upset with the way things were going, he prayed that God would rain down fire and brimstone on his enemies. I mean, oh God, you get them. Go get, these people are troubling me. Go get them. And he did that during that time. Now, as an old man, he comes back and he says, look, don't fret, don't fear, don't envy, don't do that. It's just not worth it. And so he, uh, he addressed this problem, and it's, it seems to be a perpetual problem. Why do the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer? He addressed it, or the, it's Asaph addressed it in Psalm 73, David again in Psalm 49. The whole book of Job really is a, pretty much a, a rehearsal of this thought, why do the righteous suffer? So we join David in this. Uh, we, can, we can ask the same question. Why is there so much turmoil and fear in the streets? Why do the wicked seem to prosper? Um, in reaction to these questions, these are the things that make an impact, especially on our children, and an impact on us. And of course, they deter- our reaction determines whether we turn the light on for Christ or whether we make it even darker during these times. Nobody is comfortable with the COVID-19 event. Uh, nobody Nobody is enjoying the separation. Nobody's enjoying that. However, at the same time, we have to understand that God is good and he does good. Psalm 145, 17, he is doing good. Whether it's in your life individually uh, individually, or whether it's our life corporately, God is good and he's doing good. And one good thing he's doing is he's stopping the world in its tracks. And I'm telling you, there is an awareness that things are out of the control of man right now, and there is an opportunity for the church, opportunity for believers now, perhaps greater than at any other time, and we need to take this opportunity. Now, we're going to talk about this. How are we tempted to react in trouble? Uh, How are we uh, tempted to react in all of these things? And we see it right away in the first two verses. I read them just a moment ago. We're tempted to fret. We're tempted to be envious. Now, we understand envy. Everybody knows what that is. It means to be jealous, to cry foul, uh, to cry foul that the wicked person makes his plans and schemes and he seems to just enjoy life and never pay the price while people who want to follow 
follow the Lord and do His will and, and live in accordance to what His, what His requirements are, uh, we seem to suffer. We seem to just do without and have far less. And uh, we look at that and it seems to give us a very difficult time. So we understand envy, envy, jealousy, envy, covetousness. Not a word we, we struggle with. But I want you to look at the other word. It says there, the ver- first, very first verse, says, do not fret. Fret. You say, well, I know what that means. It means don't fear. Well, that's one of the meanings. But I've dug into that word a little bit. I've studied it this week. And it means much more than fear. And I fear that the word fret in this passage is not talking about fear. It's talking about something else. And it means this. It means to be hot. It means to be furious. It means to become angry. It means to get kindled in your spirit to where you're ready to do something to somebody. It says don't fret. Don't get angry. Don't get upset. Don't get, don't get riled. This is what he's saying to us. In this passage of Scripture. Look down at verse number 8 and we'll prove it just in the context. It said in uh, chapter 37 as he sums up this first section, he says, Cease from anger, forsake wrath, do not fret, it only causes harm. He says, you know, calm down, be cool, take it easy, just sit back. We cannot do this. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. David now is speaking from experience. He he wrote those imprecatory psalms, but now he comes to the end of his life and he says, look, he said, uh, there's a lot of awful, awful things going on out there in the world, but at the end of, uh, end of my life, I can tell you, don't get jealous and don't get mad. We need to remember that our earthly existence for us is as close to hell as we're ever going to get. And this earthly existence for those that are the wicked are as close to heaven as they're ever going to get. God is doing something in the world and he knows how to make things right. So, do we live in times of trouble and crisis? Yes, we do. How do we find a pathway to peace when there's so many problems? Well, the first thing we do is take our eyes off the world and the wicked and we put our eyes on Jesus. That's the first thing. We got to look up from the situation and look to the Savior. We got to remember that the ungodly are like the grass, like the flower of the field, like the chaff the wind blows away, here today and gone tomorrow. And when we see evil in the world, we ought to feel a holy anger at it, but that's where it stops. We're not supposed to try to solve it and try to fix it because we're not going to get it right. How many of you believe that God can handle the wickedness that's in the world? How many of you believe he knows how to handle it? Just raise your hand up. Amen. So don't fret. Don't get heated up. Don't, don't get angry. Calm down. Chill out. Cool down. And then do this. There's five very clear imperatives in this passage of Scripture. Very clear steps we take as believers in the passage of Scripture. Number one, walk by faith. If you're looking at your, I was going to say on your scripture sheet, you can write it down, but we don't have those. So you can just look at your app or you can look on there and see it. Walk by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. And the emphasis of the verse is for the believer to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Walk by faith, walk with him. And when it's accomplished, God will smile on us. Now, look at the words he uses. Look at the subpoints under chapter 37 now in verse number three. Uh, it says, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Number one, trust God. That's it. You say, well, that's a simplistic answer. Just trust God. Yes, but it's the right answer. It's the Bible answer. This is what we do. Uh, We walk by faith and not sight. We remember that things are never as they appear to our human vision. This is something we need to come to grips with. All that is going on in the world right now that we see on the surface is just the surface of the story. There's far more going on than we see. God is doing things that we don't know anything about. COVID-19, if we say, oh, well, it's just terrible things are happening, we wish they weren't, then we're just letting it be up to chance or we're letting it be up to the devil. Well, God's in control. We have to understand that. God is doing something out. You know, uh, we have to understand that God is working out his eternal purpose, and it's for our good and for his glory, according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I read about Joseph again this week. Uh, His life certainly wasn't going toward the dream that he had had when he was young, a dream of grandeur. His life was going the opposite direction. He had already spent time in a dry pit, betrayed by his brothers. He had spent time in Potiphar's service where for his good service, he ended up getting lied about and he was cheated and then false accusations were made. And then he spent time in Pharaoh's dungeon, but the truth is, is that the path to being prime minister of Egypt led him through hard times and difficult places. 
We have to understand that God is always doing something. God is always working. The hand of the Lord worketh all the time. He's not, he's not just inactive in what's going on. You know, there's a difference in God being silent and God being inactive. God may not be speaking to you. He may not be speaking as he was in the 400 years of silent years, but that doesn't mean God is inactive. God is working all the time. Now, let me just give you this. Please write it down. Don't forget this. Write it on the margin somewhere of your Bible or on a note paper. Just this. Remember this, that there are times when God's ways are difficult to figure out. But during the times you cannot trace God, trust God. You may not be able to trace and figure out what he's doing, but he knows what he's doing. You can trust him. Romans 1.17 says this, the just shall live by what? Faith. faith. That's the verse that set afire the flames of the Reformation that changed the world. The just shall live by faith. So we walk by faith. And how do we do it? We trust God. Trust him. Say, God, I don't understand it, but you do. And I trust you. I look to you. I stare at you. Number two, do good. Do good. When I was growing up, that used to be a, almost a criticism. You know, somebody could look at somebody and say, well, he's just a do-gooder. They'd say, well, I just do-gooder, a do, holy Joe do-gooder, and they would criticize. Why would we do that when Jesus went about in his whole life doing good, the Bible says? And that's what he did. Do good. Faith without works is dead, the Bible says. Now, we're living at a time when there is tremendous need. We don't have to look far to find people that are in need. We can do things corporately as a church, and sometimes we try to plan things. I don't think it's the most effective way, but we try to plan things and give you opportunities and give you ideas. Uh, due to the COVID-19 virus, hunger is a problem. Our missions offering that we mentioned earlier is uh, C-19 Relief 2020. The saints of God relieving the saints of God who are going through great hunger and, and uh, being deprived of those most necessary things in the world. The places where our missionaries are serving, the reports are coming, they're hungry, they're starving. And so you've already responded, you've got this week and next to continue to give toward that mission project, the saints of God relieving the saints of God. And so we're doing that. Thursday of this week, uh, the student ministry reported, Jonathan and Andrew, that the students bagged up and delivered 300 blessing bags to other students, uh, inviting them to church if they didn't come, trying to be a blessing and encouragement with some spiritual things and some, some trinkets and so on to be a blessing to them. But what we need the most, what really needs to happen the most is that individually, each and every one of us, is that when we see a need, we fill it. And you understand that's the New Testament definition of love. Love is not just a, form, a warm fuzzy. It's not just an emotional thing. Love is when we see needs and we fill those needs. How dwells the love of God in our heart if we see our brother have need and close up our bowels of compassion and do nothing to help them? You see, that's not love. See, love sees needs and we fill them. Now I want you to flip in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. I'm going to read a passage to you quickly that gives a picture of what the prophet was decrying among God's people during that time because they were very religious. They were pulling the levers and pushing the buttons. They were doing everything that was required to be good Judaizers during that day, to be good Jews keeping the law. But their heart wasn't in it. They were making sacrifices. They were even very proud of their fasting and prayer. Look at verse number six. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you should break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? And when you see the naked that you cover him and hide not yourself then, uh, that, and then what will happen because of that? Verse 8, your light will break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. Look at this. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And then here's a promise. You will call on the Lord and I will answer. You will cry and he will say to you, here I am. Verse 10, if you extend your soul to the hungry, you satisfy the afflicted soul. Then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually. He'll satisfy your soul in a drought. It goes on and on. What is he saying? That great credibility for our message is gained when we do good. 
When we see a need and feel it, when there's somebody who's hurting and we help them, when somebody, maybe it's just, I know times are tough and I know things are bad. Can I pray for you, pray with you? Can I help you with whatever's going on? Or did you lose your job? Can I bring you some groceries? And this is individual. You see, we do good. The world is not impressed with what we do in this room. They are impressed with what they see in their daily life. That is so incredibly important. You say, well, is this a big theme in the Bible? Psalm 34, 14, depart from evil and do good. Jesus speaking, Luke 6, 35, love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Galatians 6, 10, the apostle, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Trust God, do good. And this is all about walking by faith. Isn't that interesting? We have faith and we trust him. We have faith and we do things. Amazing. Stay put. You say, where'd you get that? Look at verse number three, dwell in the land, stay put. This is a promise, of course, that the Jews are going to inherit this land perpetually, but the worst thing that can happen for us and them is to leave or better yet disappear in the land and just let the wicked and powerful run, run everything. Uh, They are very intimidating, but we're not supposed to disappear. We're not supposed to shut up. We're supposed to quietly keep on serving, keep on speaking the love of God to people and let God deal with the wicked. That's not our job. Our job is not to deal with the wicked. Our job is to deal out the love of God to the people of our lives and thus open up an opportunity for the gospel. You know, the world They will listen if they see that we really do care and we're ready to make a sacrifice. Take comfort then knowing that God can feed us, that we can feed on God's faithfulness. That's the end of the verse. God's faithful in all of his ways. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says he's the rock. His work is perfect. All of his ways are justice. He's a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Jeremiah 3, 23, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, feed on his faithfulness. So trust God, do good, stay put, and feed on his faithfulness. Just continue to do it. Let me hurry. Number two, filter your wants. Filter your wants. What are you talking about? Look at verse four. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, goody, goody, goody. This is awesome. I can delight myself in the Lord and get everything I want. There's a lot of people interpret it that way. Look at that. Boy, I mean, if I just come in and just, you know, say the right thing, do the right thing, give the right thing, show up at the right place and do this and that. Well, I can just ask God, he'll give you, and we start making our list. I want this and I want that. That's really not what God has in mind in this passage of Scripture. Let me go on. You can tell about where a person's heart is really quickly by examining what he or she wants the most. What delights your soul? What are the objects of your hunger? What occupies the majority of your time? How do you spend your money? What are you willing to sacrifice to be able to do or to purchase something that you think is going to bring you joy or happiness? What are you willing to pay? We might ask this, what occupies most of your prayer life? Now, make no mistake, in times of trouble, in times of need, the Bible tells us to call out in times of need, we'll find grace. The Bible's clear about that. The Psalms are full of, I cried out to God in my trouble and he heard me and lifted me up out of the miry pit and set my feet on the solid rock. Of course, we call out to him in our distress. But let me ask you something else. We're invited to call on him in our times of trouble, but how much of our prayer life is kingdom related? How much of our prayer life and prayer request are kingdom related? You say, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, give us this day our daily bread and so on. But God, thy kingdom come. That's part of that model prayer that we are taught to pray. Pray for his kingdom to come. And so what does that mean, Pastor Phil? Well, pray things like this. Do we ever do it? This is the question. God, save the lost. Father, make me a better witness. Father, glorify yourself in this sickness of mine. God, take away my pride. Humble me so that you can be glorified in me. Dear Jesus, let me be more like you. Cause me to hunger and to thirst after righteousness. Father, please help us Christians show the way, shine the light, take the first step in making racial reconciliation. Lord, bring your kingdom to my heart and bring it to this 
world. Let me be just in my dealings, Lord. Let me, let justice characterize me and all of your people. Do we pray like that? Or is it just Aunt Susie, Uncle Bill, and this bill that I've got to pay? Of course, we can bring those things to the Lord. Folks, to enjoy blessings, the blessings, and ignore the blesser is to practice idolatry. To enjoy the blessings and, and to ignore the blesser is to practice idolatry, idolatry. To make your Christian experience utilitarian. You say, what is that? That is to get what I want from God and it makes God your servant. God, here's what I want. Here's what I want you to do. Who's God in this situation? Folks, if you have a wish list for God, you might be disappointed. But if you want God himself, if it's God you want, you will be delighted with that relationship. The real problem is, is that sometimes we have divided hearts. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by a divided heart? I mean, well, we have a heart for God, we, some of the things of God, but we want the world as well. We want the stuff of the world, the things of the world, the entertainment of the world, the life of the world, the goods that are in the world. We just want, we want both. We want God and we want the world. Listen to the scriptures. Psalm 86, 11, psalmist says, teach me your way, O Lord, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart. Lord, take my heart and make it one. Unite my heart to one to follow you. James 1 talks about it, about a double-minded one, but James 4 is really interesting. It says this, James 4, 8, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded people are unstable in all of their ways, but is it God we want or we just want God's stuff? We're talking about having comfort in a crisis. You know, you may not get all the stuff you want, but that doesn't mean you can't have comfort. Now listen to this. If wealth is your delight, you will be disappointed. If health is your delight, you will eventually be disappointed. If success is your delight, you'll be disappointed. If popularity is your delight, you'll be disappointed. If position and power are your delight, you'll be disappointed. If world peace is your delight, you'll have to wait on the millennium. If trouble-free living is your delight, you're in for a hard time. If a particular relationship is your delight, you may never find it. But you see, the list could go on and on. But the truth is, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the first ingredient of that is if we're going to have the joy of the Lord, then we have to make sure our joy is in the Lord. Do we joy in Him? Do we love Him? We're talking about having comfort in a crisis. And how can I have comfort in a crisis? Is your comfort going to come from God Himself? The walk with Him and the talk with Him. And the living with him and, and, and carrying everything to him. So the question is, what do you want, dear brothers? What do you want? Do you want a revival in our day? It's on my heart. It's in my mind. It's in my, on my lips. I've been praying and talking about it. And I'm trying to gather a group together tomorrow morning to pray. If, what do you want? Do you want a revival? Would you like to see stone-hearted, ice-cold, apathetic, barely committed, unmotivated believers catch fire for God? Amen. Would you like to see those same believers make a difference in the world? Then what we need to do is sift our desires. We need to look for God to be our delight. And if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires, the right desires for your heart. God will be delighted to give himself to you. Here's a great verse saying it in a different way. A New Testament verse that says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Let me make a proclamation. There's not a person in this room that is not as close to God as they want to be. Let me say that again. Every single human that knows Jesus is as close to God as you want to to be. You say, well, my, my spiritual life's a little bit stale. My Bible reading's stale. My devotional time is stale. You are as close to God as you want to be because the doorway is always open to a believer. Draw near to God. And what will he do? Draw near to you. Draw near to God. Hunger for God. Want God. Oh, it's so amazing. There's a Genesis 15 one. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and I am your exceedingly great reward. I am your reward. Wow. Okay, pastor, but how do I get what I want? Do you really want to ask that? How do I get what I want? I think we just have to go to the shepherd because the shepherd said in that psalm, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not 
want, lack. <laughs> Psalm 84, 11, the Lord is, God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Psalm 34, 10, the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall lack no good thing. Delight yourself in the Lord. Walk with the Lord. Strive for the Lord. Number three, give your fears to God. Look at verse number five here. Give your fears to God. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. Give your fears to God. Commit your way to the Lord. What does that mean? The verb means to roll off your burden. You got burdens, roll them off on the Lord. The Lord can handle them. First Peter 5, 7, cast your cares on the Lord. God can handle the wicked. Don't give it a second thought. Uh, God can handle the evil in the world, but he has something for you and me to do. Give God what you cannot handle, then get busy with what you can handle. You say, what? You mean there's a task for me to do? Something more than play and enjoy? Something more than strive for pleasure? Something more than just, you know, endure and get by? I mean, there's something, yes. Get busy with what we can do. Trust in him and he will bring your way to pass. Do what God has given us to do. Be the light. Share the news. Spread his love. Folks, God doesn't take our burdens so that we can become irresponsible, but so that we can better serve him. Sometimes less care, because we cast all our cares on him, less care makes us careless. Careless. Careless Christianity. And it leads to failure. Don't miss the teaching of Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, when Jesus said, all oh, you that heavy laden, you know, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Thank you very much, Jesus. Now I'm just going to get on my way here. No, 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 no. Stand still. Give your burden to the Lord. Cast your care on him. Lay down your burden there and then take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. You know what a yoke is. You've seen it on TV even if you hadn't seen one in person. It's a big wooden thing and an oxen or, or donkeys or horses. They put their, name, put their heads in the thing and it's across their back and they can plow. You know what's wonderful about that story? If you could just get yoked up with Jesus, you will never fail again. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Then number four, rest while you wait. What am I waiting on? Waiting on God to work out everything right for his glory and for our good. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways. He is gracious in all of his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call on him in truth, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. Wow. A lot of all's in there. He's going to do these things. Rest in him. Be still. Psalm 46.10. Now, we don't want to be still. We hate it. We want to just move and get at it and get up and get with it and so on. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. Pastor, what are you saying? Well, don't just do something. Stand there. Stand there before the Lord. There needs to be time. Some things you can't make better. Leave it to God. Be silent. You say, wait a minute. Be still. Be silent. Yeah, Habakkuk 2.20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence, but keep silence before him. We don't like this one. Silence. Solitude scares us to death. It might scare us to death, but we need it. We need some silence and some solitude. You say, well, that's just not me. I get in the car, turn on the radio. That's what I do. Okay. Get up in the morning, hit the TV button, or maybe it never went off at night. Some of us have watched, you know, all the news, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News. We've been watching ABC, CBS, and we're so full of all this bad news and everything. We're neurotic. You know, Isaiah 30, verse 15, for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning in rest, you'll be saved, delivered. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. You know, Jesus was pretty busy in the three years of ministry he had on earth. You know that? I mean, there were demons to throw out. There were diseases to cure. There were multitudes to feed. There were people to preach to, sermons to teach, Pharisees to demote. I mean, he had a lot to do. He was busy. But you know how he started all of his, you know what he did? You know what he found time to do? Found time to get alone, go up on a mountain and pray. God, hey, Father, boy, this, there's a lot going on here. Let's talk about this. Finally, number five, wrath won't work. Look at verse eight. 
Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Don't get worked up. Don't get heated. Don't get mad. Don't try to fix it. You can't, you just, you're not going to be able to fix all the wickednesses in the world. We can't. Don't get heated up. Don't get hot and bothered. That's what it says. Don't fret. Don't fret. Anger, wrath, fretting, they're all mentioned in the verse because they're all products of looking at the world, looking at the wicked, and the temptation to be jealous. When we do that, it's easy to get bitter at God, bitter at the church. When problems of life mount up against us, when we see the wicked, uh, the wicked live their lives of ease while we go through deep, dark valleys, there's a tendency to become angry with the Lord. We might think, well, there's righteous indignation, you know. Well, yeah. There he is, but realize what James 1, 19 and 20 says. It says, so then, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Listen to these words. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. How many of you ever got mad and tried to do something to fix something and it turned out worse than when you started? Raise your hand up. <laughs> Steve Miller gave me a book one time, and I read it, something about vital conversations. And in that book, it talked about the fact that if you're having a conversation and you start getting heated, start getting angry, stop the conversation. Steve, you gave me that book. It's a great book. Stop the conversation because you've stopped conversing and you've started emoting, and your anger and your adrenaline's taken over. You're ready to fight. You're not ready to converse. Stop. That's what he says right here in this verse. Cease. Stop. Forget the wrath. It won't work. <laughs> Just... Get alone, get quiet, get with the Lord. I've got to finish. Now look, folks, are we commanded just to sit back, let go, and let God handle it while we whistle a tune in life? No. Look at this verse. Get your pencil out. And under, just underline or circle these words in your passage. Here's your five imperatives. Here they are. Trust in the Lord. Here they are. Dwell, delight, commit, rest, cease. Do you see those words? These are words we're supposed to look at. Trust, delight, commit, rest, cease. God is calling us to take control of ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and it ends up saying, and self-control. Self-control. You know, I may not be able to, happen, to control all of the happenings of my life, but I can control how I respond to them with the Lord's help. We're supposed to look to Jesus because He's the author and the finisher. Now, let me finish saying this, I want you to do this. You got seven days. Here's a seven-day assignment for you. I would like you in the next seven days to figure out a way to draw near to God, you, you personally. I say something like that, and people go buy a new Bible, and they buy a journal, and they get all fixed up, and they forget to do it. You don't need a new Bible. You don't need a new journal. If you want to write something down, get some notebook paper. It'll save you money. Just do it. Find a time, find a place, say, God, you know, things are bad in the world. Tell him all about it. You can tell him anything you want. You know, that's the safest place to complain. You can complain all you want, say anything you want, tell God what you're upset about, what's going wrong, and what you're worried about, and he won't tell anybody that you're upset. Draw near to God. You want to be close to God? Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Here's the way it works. God, I want to get closer. Okay, let's get closer. God, I want to get closer. All right, let's get closer. God said to a group of people one day, he said, look, I want you to draw near to me. And 70 people stepped up and said, use me. And he sent them out two by two to take the gospel. He said it again. And three people stepped, three stepped forward and said, I want to get closer. And they became Peter, James, and John, the intimate, or 12 of them, and then three of them. And then John got a chance to lean on his breast at the Lord's Supper. He was the closest. He was the one that even said, I'm the disciple who God loves. You know why? Because they just kept stepping closer. Here's your job this week. Church, here's your job. Draw near to God. If we're going to make turn on the light in the world, it's not going to be because we decide to. It's going to be because we've gotten so close to the Lord that He flows out. His love is going to flow out of us. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you and you'll be amazed at what you do in response to your closeness to the Lord. Draw near to God. Number two, do good. Do good. You say, what do you mean? I mean, eyes open, ears open, asking God, Lord, there's somebody 
that needs my encouragement, a word of prayer, a helping hand, a meal, a, a $10 bill, a $20. They, there's somebody, Lord, give me the chance. You see, the Bible says if we close up our hearts of compassion to the cries around us, that the love of God may not even dwell in us at all. Do good. Look for the opportunity. Oh, I'm tempted to share stories just even this week. Do good. Draw near. Do good. Let's pray. Father, please add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word and help us to do good. Help us to draw near. Help our righteousness to have a voice. Help us to be able to say something to this world because they see that we care. In Jesus' name, amen.